And the only way that I thought that I would be able to do anything was by my physical appearance and manipulation. I quit school at 16 years old and became a barber. Because I knew that the way I was going to make a living wasn't going to be from an education. Because I was told my entire life I was dyslexic and I was ADHD. So I had trouble sitting still and I had trouble learning. So I just gave up on it. I pretty much gave up on everything. So <laughs> I quit school and, and um, in very dysfunctional relationships and in and out of jail. And um, I left, my ch I had three children. I left those children, my youngest daughter was six years old and I left home. My husband got three different women pregnant in a 12 year marriage. And I, I just gave up, I said, this is it, I can't do it anymore. I walked away from my children, I went and I had for real. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. I walked away from everything. I decided, I decided that I was gonna move. I went to drug rehab for the last time and in drug rehab they talked about uh, geographical change. So I decided that I was gonna get me a geographical change and I moved to Daytona Beach from Tallahassee. I moved to Daytona Beach, I got my three kids, I brought them with me, I got an apartment, I did good, I was going to church, trying to do good, trying to live for the Lord. I don't know about y'all, but I've always loved God. Since the day I was born, he's all I've ever had. And even in my addiction, he was still there with me. He's always been with me. Even when I didn't smell good, even when I wasn't doing good, he's always been there with me. I remember the times he's held me. I know the times that he's kept me from getting killed. I moved to Daytona Beach. I tried to take care of my kids, and I did it for about the first school year that we were there. And when summertime came, I couldn't make enough money to take care of all three of them. So I took them home for the summer, and I decided that um, I was going to go back to Daytona Beach and work two jobs so that I could come and pick them up in the school yard store school year started and I did that. I took them home, told them I loved them, and I'll come back and get you before school started, and that never happened. Um, I started working for Bike Week in Daytona Beach, and uh, from Bike Week I became Miss Budweiser, and from Miss Budweiser I went to the very top of the top of the top, and I got me a job working with the Cuba Cartel. And um, I think most of y'all know what happened after that, the Cuba Cartel didn't play any games, and I was bringing drugs over from Cuba, flying dropping kilos and kilos of cocaine on the water and just doing all kinds of things. Marrying Cubans for green cards and just had it going on. I thought it was everything. I had all the material things that I could ever imagine. I drove the best cars, I went to the best places, I wore the best clothes, I had the best of everything and I thought that was my worth. Because that's what I had been told my whole life, that's what it was gonna be. Well, before I knew it, that addiction got so bad they didn't want anything to do with me anymore. So then I went to work in the strip clubs. And then from the strip clubs, from the escort companies, from the escort companies, it went down from there. Because the more drugs I did, the worse the men got and the worse the lifestyle got. I went back to Daytona Beach from South Beach, Miami. And I was working in a strip club at Daytona Beach by the name of Lollipop. So I worked in every strip club in that city. I was working at Lollipop during my Toberfest and I um, had a guy that had been running and chasing me around in there. And, uh, and I, I don't know why, but I didn't have anything to do with him. So one night, um, he followed me home, and I broke into my house and raped me and sodomized me, busted all my teeth out, sodomized me, had 68 stitches in my bone, and broke all my ribs but three, broke my jaw in two places, broke my nose, I've had plastic surgery all over my face. And that night, I was lifelighted to um, Halifax Hospital, and laying in my hospital room, I looked up and I said, you know, God, you know, why do you keep saving me? You know, why, why do you keep doing this? What is this purpose for my life? There must be some reason you won't let me die. I'm so miserable and I'm so hopeless. You know, I was released from the hospital uh, because of the lifestyle I lived. The investigators did not see very much um, reason to investigate too much further. And so I was just released back to the same um, place that I lived and I went back to that place and I sold everything I had and, and one day I just decided it's over, that I'm done. And I walked away from everything, anything, any pictures, anything that I had from my life, I just walked away and I became homeless. And um, for the first time in my life, teeth knocked out, I looked a mess. And I went out, started eating out of dumpsters, living in the streets, learned a prostitute, walked around as a homeless prostitute for about three years. And um, was raped, I've been shot, I've been stabbed, multiple, multiple, multiple stab wounds all over my chest. You know, and I'd have to go in, and they'd have to do plastic surgery, and just put me back together. But I kept asking God, you know, what is this purpose for my life? Why do you keep raising me from the dead? 
I should have been dead so many times. They would say, she'll not, she's not going to make it this time. You know, I'd OD and I'd end up in a ditch somewhere laying in my own puke. And I'd wake up and I'm like, man, why don't you just let me go from here? What is the reason for this? And, you know, there would be little glimpses of times that I wouldn't be on drugs that I would wake up and think about, you know, about this time it had been about eight years since I'd seen my children. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. That addiction takes over and you don't realize how long it takes. You don't realize what it does to us. We don't realize what it is, you know. Addiction just takes over and we have to have that more than anything else in our life. It makes us so selfish. It makes us so self-centered. I ended up living under a pimp in a trap pimp in a, tra in a trap house, being sold and put on a street corner, you know, for about two and a half years, just living that life, just getting my face beat in every day. You know, and I cried out to God, I said, God, I can't do this anymore. In and out of jail, in and out of jail, in and out of jail. But you know what? I go to jail and I go to church when I got out of confinement usually. And I go to church and I get my Bible and I start to read my Bible and they say, the church ladies would say, come up here and say this little prayer and everything's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. I went up there and said that prayer upside down backwards and sideways. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't be a church lady. And I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't really want to be. Because mm -hmm. all I saw was judgment. I saw religion. I didn't, I wanted real, man. Show me how to get free. Show me, I, I, I know how to talk Christianese. I was a master manipulator. I can tell you what you want. You know, they say, oh, say this little prayer and everything's going to be okay. I said, I can do that in here. But how do I, what do I do when I leave here? Can I go home with you? You ain't going to do that. <laughs> so, so I went in and out, and I went in and out, went in and out. And, you know, the last time I was there, I did about 11 months and 29 days, and I'm in and out of prison. I just couldn't get it. You know, I did anything and everything, anything and everything, just to try to fill that void. Writing sugar daddies and had sugar daddies, and just using and abusing anybody and everybody I could even get my hands on. If I was talking, I was lying. If my mouth was open, I was lying. If I was talking to you, I was fixing either rob you or I was manipulating you out of something. A nine millimeter was my best friend. I was a mess in the streets. Any fighters in here? I love to fight. Love to bust somebody's teeth out. It's my favorite thing to do. Just walk up to you and just punch you right in the mouth. Don't care how big you are. Don't matter if the bigger you are, the harder you fall. Just didn't care. Kill me. What did I have to lose, right? That's who I was. That's who I was. I had no fear, none at all. No fear of walking down the street at 4 o'clock in the morning with a 9mm and rob a 400 pound drug dealer and steal his car. No one is going to kill me if he finds me. I don't care. Kill me. Finally, I got sick and tired, man. And I was out on the street and I said, God, I just can't do this anymore. I went to a church. And I'm strong out. I don't think I had slept in about two weeks. I went to this big church in Daytona Beach. Didn't even have shoes on my feet. And um, they had this homeless church bus. So I get on this homeless church bus. My feet were bleeding. I'll never forget it. I couldn't hold my eyes open. I was smoking crack in the people's bathroom in church. I had a needle in my arm in there. I just laid out on the back of the toilet. But I went inside of the um, church building, and I'll never forget, he did an altar call. And I ran up to the altar, I had a crack pipe in my hand. I ran up to the altar, and I just hit my knees out there, and I just cried out to God. And I said, whatever it's going to take, whatever it's going to take, just do it. And the pastor's wife came up to me, and she said, Jesus loves you, and you're royalty. I said, you all right. Girl, you don't know. <laughs> I'm about as far from royalty as a person can get. But I left church that day and I said, well, this feels good right now up here at this altar, but I know I'm going to have to leave here in about 15 minutes and I'm going to have to go back out and survive. Mm -hmm. And I did. About two weeks after that, um, I was driving a stolen car and I had a whole bunch of drugs on me and I got stopped and I got five new felonies. And so this stopped, it was 46 felonies. And um, the officer stopped me and pulled me over and um, pulled the crack out of the back of my throat and we rolled around and I hit him and he tased me and handcuffed me and put me in the car and I was stinging and crying and ODing in the back seat and he took me to jail and he said, Dawn, you need to change your life, man. I watched you go from one end of the arena to the other. And he said, you need Jesus. And I thought to myself, I have never needed Jesus more in my life than I do right now because I feel like I'm about to die right here. And he took me to jail and I went in jail and I was fighting and cussing and screaming and biting and they locked me in the black chair and put a net over my head and 
And, uh, and I sat there for a few hours until I calmed down enough to where they could throw me in the um, solitary confinement. And because of the fact that they were scared that I was going to kill myself, I always went in a straitjacket because I was known for hanging myself by the sheets. So they would put me in a straitjacket and they would let me come through that phase until they would let me sit in their neck. So this time I'm sitting there and I'm in a straight jacket and I said, I just can't do this anymore. I'm sick and tired, man. I said, whatever it's going to take, God, whatever it's going to take. So I started screaming and yelling and the man, they bring me a Bible and they bring me a Bible and they took me out of my straight jacket and I'm sitting there and I'm reading and I'm praying and I'm like, I just can't do this anymore. I was facing uh, 15 to 25 years in prison with 46 felons. I should be on death row for the things that I've done. I'll be quick to tell you that. Oh, I deserve to be there. I deserve to be dead. You know, but only by the grace of God am I here. They took me, they took me out of confinement and they took me and put me in general population. And I could tell something was different, you know. Um, the word began to make sense to me. I'm, I'm extremely dyslexic and I have a really, really hard time with reading comprehension. But for some reason now when I was reading the word, I was beginning to understand what it said. You know, and I kept reading and I'd go to church and I went to church in jail and a lady, I had written, uh, read Isaiah 61 and I, I read that and God said, I anointed you to do these things. And it began to give me a little bit of purpose and it began to give me a little bit of hope. And I said, okay, God, I said, are you sure this is you? And I went to church, I will never forget it in jail and um, the church lady came in and she said, I don't know who this is for, but it's Luke 4, 18 and it's the same scripture. And it gave me confirmation for the first time in my life that Jesus is with me and that he was real. And so I stood on that and he gave me that purpose and I said, so if this is what you want me to do, how much time in prison do you want me to do? Because I know that's where I'm headed. I said, but I'm willing to do whatever it takes. You know what I need better than I need myself. And I knew that. And I cried out to him and I said, so whatever it's going to take, God. I went to court and thank God that it wasn't the same judge that had sentenced me on the other 46 felonies. It happened to be a different judge that day, by the grace of God. And he said, I'm not going to give you all that time, young lady. He said, I'm going to give you 18 months in prison with six months jail addiction treatment program. He said, I don't know why. He said, but if you come back in my courtroom, don't even bother bringing a toothbrush. I have everything you need. And I did. And I knew that God was with me that day. I knew I should be on death row. I knew I should have a life sentence in prison. I knew that. But I knew also that I had cried out to God and I said, whatever it's going to take, I'm a bloom where I'm planted, whatever it's going to take. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I can begin to keep reading my Bible in that six months, you know, I'm doing what I needed to do. And I could tell something was changing in me. But I was still very angry and I was still really hurt. And I was still hitting people in the mouth. I was still smart off at people, you know, I was still real ugly. You know, and um, anyway, after I finished that, they sent me to prison, and I got to prison, and my second day there, uh, I got to a fight, and just about beat a girl to death. And, um, I mean, we got down, and uh, I got hogtied, uh, gassed, and hogtied, and videotaped going across the compound again at Lowell Correctional Facility. And um, they shut the whole prison down. It was a big scene, and I'm like, here I go again, you know, this thing, I'm never going to get it. You know, I'm never going to be able to do this. I felt like God rejected me because I kept saying that prayer, but I didn't change. Nothing changed. I didn't know how to be like those people. And I felt like that God didn't love me, and that's why I couldn't change. So back to confinement again, back to a straight jacket I went, and they locked me in a little cell, and I started screaming. And I started screaming, if you're really real, and you're really who you say you are, you can really do what this word says, change me. And I was screaming, and I was beating my head up against the wall until it was just pure bloody in there. And I said, just change me. Just change me. And I'll tell y'all something, the power of God fell in that place, and I got blood transfusion. And my life is never going to say. But God's love came down like an avalanche. And I'm going to tell you something, if you're still struggling, you have to have a real encounter. Because when you really get hit by the Holy Ghost, when you really get Born touched again. by God, Born again. Changes. Amen. When you receive power from the Lord, let me tell you something, I got baptized in the Holy Ghost and I didn't believe in it. <laughs> I started speaking in tongues and I'm like, what is this?
belong to. But God, it's his house anyway, right? Thank God for a praying man, because yesterday I watched the news and I'm like, oh, all I could see was water flowing through my neighborhood. And he just grabbed my head and started praying. But he told me, I said, thank you, Jesus. I gave it right back to God because fear tried to come in. I said, well, I don't watch TV. <laughs> That's what I had. Ten minutes of me opening that door and I'm like, ah! But you know, so many of us go through some things. You know, it's not about our past. It's about what he does. It's about his glory. It's about his love. It's about who he Do you realize that our biggest weapon is love? You know, the Bible, you get offended at everything. Oh, that offends me, that offends me. Oh, she offended me, she offended me. You know, the Bible says, great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Thank you. That is nothing. So when somebody looks at you a certain way, pray for them. Amen. When somebody says something to you, pray for them. Yeah. Amen. When somebody's ugly to you, they're going through something. Go ahead, pray for your sister. Pray for your brother. They're going through something. You know, I know this is about praise and the and, and Jesus just kept giving me the scripture in Psalm 62, 5 and 6, and it says, um, My soul wait now only upon God, for my expectation is from him. He only, I got that? He only is my 